I am Philomena Mbetemwilo. I am the elected representative of the Supreme Court to the Judicial Service Commission. I'm also the Deputy Chief Justice of the Republic of Kenya. Thank you. Good morning, Council. Good morning, Commissioner. I'm, I'm Patrick Shohi, representing Public Service. Karibu. Asante. Uh, good morning, Senior Counsel. Good morning, my lord. I am David Majanja, Judge of the High Court, Commissioner representing Kenya Magistrates and Judges Association. You're Thank welcome. You. Thank you. Good morning, Senior Counsel. Good morning, Commissioner. I'm Oluande Evelyn, Chief Magistrate. I'm, I'm the female representative of KV KMJ. Asante. <clears throat> good morning, Senior Counsel. My name is Machari Anjero. I represent uh, the Law Society of Kenya. Good morning, Commissioner. Good morning, Senior Counsel. My name is Felix Koske. I represent the public. Asante, Commissioner. Morning, uh, Senior Counsel. My name is Mohamed Warsame, Judge of Appeal. Welcome. Asante, my lord. A very good morning, uh, Senior Counsel Fred Ngatia. Good morning, Karakari I am the Attorney General, and I'm here by virtue of that office. Asante, sir. Senior Counsel, I'm Olive Mugenda, uh, Commissioner representing the public, and chairing these uh, interviews. We also have uh, the Secretary to JSC, and also the um, Chief Registrar of Judiciary, Honorable Anna Madi. Good morning, Senior Counsel. Good morning, CRJ. And we also have Frida Mukaya, who is a registrar of JSC. At the corner there, thank you. So a few housekeeping uh, issues, uh, Senior Council. Uh, please feel free to uh, ask commissioners to repeat a question if you're not sure, or to clarify. Um, after two hours or so, we will have a short break. And Madam Anna Madi has got you to where you you're going to have your break. Otherwise, uh, it's supposed to be a conversation. See the council, so should all relax and have the conversation. So I'll kick off the interview by giving you five five to ten minutes in the council to tell us why you feel you are the best suited candidate to be CJ. And I will just five to ten minutes because the other issues will come with the commissioners. Thank you. Asante Professor, uh, perhaps I should uh, first and foremost say I started my legal career at Attorney General Chambers in 1980. That was the first place I was employed. Within a relatively short period of time, I was allocated very many difficult briefs. I'll mention only two. I was involved together with the head of station head of my section, Mr. Frank Shields, with the acquisition of the land where Kasarani Sports Complex is constructed. The owners of that parcel of land, a company called Salopia, Salopia Limited, had objected to government acquiring that land because we were using the Land Acquisition Act. And it's a prerequisite in that act that when government is using that act, it's got to be for a public purpose. And because of what was then happening, the owners were saying, this is nothing more than government taking this land for its own purposes. We did overcome that formidable challenge, and after overcoming that challenge in the High Court, then we went on to the issue of compensation. It was handled by the chief valuer, and that is why this republic has a near Olympic stadium at Kasarani. Soon thereafter, Attorney General nominated me to look at a very difficult problem that has persisted in this country, or had persisted in this country from the time of independence. That is the difficulty of international boundary between Kenya and Sudan. I was entrusted with that task. Ultimately, 
government, together with the British Council, sponsored me to undertake a master's in law program at London School of Economics, and as part of the LLM program, to undertake original research in Kenya-Sudan boundary. I was at LSC. I spent numerous hours at public records office because commissioners, all the documents of this republic during the colony and protectorate status all those documents are, the, are at public records office. I'm sure commissioners, you know where public records office is, is towards Heathrow Airport at Kew Gardens. So I had to commute from LSC, which is at the Strand, and go to this public records office every other single day, and I acquired a wealth of material. In one minute, commissioners, at the turn of, or towards uh, 1914, the boundary was defined by the British government as a straight line between two fixed points. Or in the alternative, such a line that would give to us the customary grazing grounds of the Trukana. Those grazing grounds were never defined. But towards 1938, a survey party established that the boundary was slightly above the straight line. That was not to be. We went on, and Sudan demarcated what they call 1950 Sudanese patrol line. That Sudanese patrol line is what actually triggered my interest in this area. And by application of principles of international law, I actually established that when any government allows a competing government to administer an area, the doctrines of acquiescence, doctrines of renunciation of territory, they all kick in. I hope we'll have an opportunity to discuss this in greater detail, but in one sentence, we were able or I was able in my research to establish that the Sudanese patrol line, which is a considerable distance from the straight line, is now the international boundary. So, commissioners, I'm sure you all remember, in 1980s, the Kenya-Sudan boundary was indicated as a straight line. Then in 1985-86, we had an extended boundary that went towards Sudan. The difference in graphic terms is that, that through this research and the validation that went on in government, we were able to change our international boundary from the straight line to the new boundary, and we acquired 9,680 square kilometers. To put it in context, the former Western province was 4,000 7,400 square meters. So we acquired a territory larger than the former Western province. This is one of my research papers. It went through government, it went through validation. I cannot say that it was singular effort. The Attorney General and other organs of state all participated and ultimately we changed our boundary. I then went to private practice from 1987. I've conducted numerous cases of interest would be I acted for ECK in the Krigra Commission and also in the Waki Commission where it was demonstrated that weak laws, weak institutions, weak governance structures can actually collapse any republic. Krigra Commission report demonstrated and illustrated the weaknesses which were within our legal system and the lack of capacity in the electoral process and the lack of independence in the judiciary. I was part of a team. My team leader was John Musioka Annan. I was his able assistant 
and we also had Nyamodi, Paul Nyamodi is one of my colleagues, a team of three, we represented ECK. It was a gigantic effort. We learned so much about the need to have proper laws and proper capacities in key institutions that deal with elections and the need to have an independent judiciary. Professor, thereafter, I don't, I, I've given my CV, I was instructed to work for National Assembly, and this is interesting, against the Senate in an advisory opinion at the Supreme Court. You may remember that there were the tough wars at the beginning of the 2010 Constitution, which is the Superior House. But like lawyers, we do what we know best. We posed what appeared to be a very innocuous question. Which house should originate a money bill? But behind that innocuous question was whose business is it to legislate division of revenue bill? Because if it came to be my client, National Assembly, to legislate division of revenue bill, it means then we are in total control over devolution. And Senate was saying, no, it can't be. It is a joint effort. We came to Supreme Court. We argued on this matter. I lost, but with one dissenting judge saying that the issue was not justiciable. With that loss, devolution became entrenched as a principle that must be followed. But that was not the end of it. Barely two years ago, I was again instructed by the Council of Governors also about division of revenue bill. This time because the opinion that had been given to both houses was being ignored. I did that matter and the Council of Governors was quite happy with the outcome. In between, I have conducted many other cases, and in my view, if I could summarize in one minute, you've had a CJ from academia who did wonderful work. I've looked at his transformation agenda. Allow me to say this with tremendous respect to my former lecturer. It is as profound or second in as profound to the Constitution. I can't see any other agenda as profound as just Chief Justice Mutunga's agenda. Then you had a judge of this court as a Chief Justice with his agenda, which took us to another level. We have more magistrates, more judges, courts all over the country, a wonderful experience. But what you now lack is somebody who has been a consumer of this service. I've been knocking at the doors of the High Court, Magistrates Court, I've been to all the courts in this Republic. I have that eye that no other would have. For 40 years, I've been in Magistrates Court, everywhere, I've been as far as Lokitang, I've been in every part of this country. We had 14 High Court judges at 2011. I've been to each of those, I've been to every court of appeal station in this country. Uh, when Supreme Court started, I was one of the early practitioners in that court. I have practiced in that court. I have had I have wonderful professional relationship with the judges of that court. And I do believe, Professor, that I have that eye, a practitioner's eye, that can be able to see the real weaknesses and the perceived weaknesses and come up with a transformation agenda slightly advanced from access to justice, from access to justice to another agenda that would be, which we will discuss as we get along. Thank you, Prof. Thank you. Thank you very much, Senior Counsel. Um, clearly, Senior Counsel, you are, you are successful uh, lawyers, senior counsel by all standards, uh, given what you have told us and also what you have read from your CV. 
What I haven't heard, as in the case, what I want you to explain to us is, is uh, I've, I've not seen much evidence of Mr. Gatia, the leader. So please demonstrate to the commission and to the public that you are that transformative leader we are looking for. I'm interested in tangible achievements in, you know, in leadership and also maybe institutional changes that you have uh, done, and, and that can be attributed to your leadership, leadership excellence, Senior Council. Thank you, Prof. Uh, Prof, of course, I must also acknowledge your transformation of an ordinary college, uh, college to iconic status. So allow me to pick a college, a university college, as an example. I have so many examples, but allow me to take a university college. Commissioners, you may all recall University of Nairobi, virtually every now and then students who go on strike. It became so perennial that we were wondering whether we should have a university next to the human population around the city of Nairobi because of the rampant wastage that used to happen. About three or four years ago, I was request, requested by the Senate to look for what are the EUs bedeviling this university. Prior thereto, I had been involved as counsel in a lot of disciplinary cases that went to the High Court. And those disciplinary cases used to have almost a circular effect. You discipline a student, expel him, and then that prov uh, provokes a riot at the campus. You do not do that, then again another circular effect. And when Senate engaged me with a student population of 80,000, I started working with the university administration. Prof, at University of Nairobi, there are eight colleges. No, sorry, there are six colleges. Each college had its own independent dip disciplinary process. So we'd have a college, for example, humanities and social sciences at the main campus with near to 18 faculties under it. You have another college, say, biological sciences or agriculture at Kabete. Each of the six colleges would have its own disciplinary uh, structure. Then for the halls of residence, there were eight distinct. Consequently, honorable commissioners, you have, so to speak, pocket, semi-autonomous pockets of disciplinary bodies all dealing with the 80,000 students. And of course, what will go to the academic, the colleges, would be anything to do with academic, but for residential, it's what would go to the halls of residence. I studied this, I engaged all the colleges, we had seminars and we had so many workshops. And then I looked at comparative in, uh, colleges like Pretoria, Harvard, my former college LSC or University of London, and I actually saw what is the problem with this premier university. It's the seventh university in Africa, but they had not got it right. You cannot have a disciplinary process which has no harmony. So what was ailing this college is the fact that there was no harmony in the sentences that are awarded to students. There's no harmony in what is a disciplinary offense. And I crafted a student handbook that was to operate and is to operate across board. So you do not have a student in one college being expelled while asked for identical offense or misdemeanor or trans, uh, transgression, he is just told, do not repeat that again. Consequently, and I say this without any fear of uh, contradiction, the harmony you now see at this university is a direct attribute of the work that we did. I must, of course, acknowledge that I have received tremendous support from the Senate and from all the college principals and all the academic staff. We were able to actually transform 
what was becoming more or less a perennial problem of indiscipline to now a college where I'm sure commissioners you cannot recall the last time you saw university students throwing stones along Koinange Street. And I have many, many other examples of equal kind in that I've had occasion to deal with. So, Senior Council, are you the chairman of the board, of, of the council of Nairobi University? Or? No, I, I, whatever work I did, I did as an ex consultant. Oh, okay. I did as a consultant at the request of the Senate. I was reporting to the Senate, and they authorized me to have meetings with any person within the university. So I started off with uh, the academic staff, and then went on with the college heads, and then as we went along, I, I got across a very, very good idea of why indiscipline had become the order of the day. So um, there's a follow-up question, uh, Senior Council. You're going to be leading a workforce of probably like 5,000 judicial officers and judicial staff. So how will that experience then help you to lead this big workforce in the judiciary? The principles in leadership, uh, Prof, Commissioners, apply for a workforce of 20, and they would apply for a workforce like the Boeing man aircraft manufacturer. It is all a question of how you are able to be a leader. I should have indicated that later in life, I did a postgraduate, a second master's degree in applied philosophy at Strathmore University. In that, I learned business ethics, philosophy as a tool, and leadership really clearly understood what you are looking for are the four cardinal virtues. The four cardinal virtues are prudence, temperance, fortitude, and justice. If you have the four cardinal virtues, you'll be a leader of 10, a leader of 100, a leader of a million. It is not administrative skills, it's leadership. And in leadership, you are looking for the four cardinal virtues. And this is an applied principle in all the blue ship companies all over the world. We had an empirical uh, research at Strathmore about who are transforma uh, transformative leaders in all the companies in the world. And what stands out is somebody who manifests in deed and in word that you have the four cardinal virtues. I can say without any fear that I have tried my very level best to manifest and to inculcate the four cardinal virtues in everything I do. Before I conclude, from the four cardinal virtues, you collapse into two other, so to speak, abilities that you must work on, which is humility and magnanimity. So from the four cardinal virtues, on a day-to-day -day applications, there must be humility and magnanimity. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Senior Counsel. You, you talked about the vision a little bit when, when you said that you move from uh, transforming judiciary, from access to justice, you know, move it forward a little more. Please talk a little bit about that, your vision, and how you are going to rally uh, all the stakeholders behind you to, to achieve that vision. Uh, as a consumer of the service, as a consumer of this service, and here I must say that as a consumer I have that little more knowledge because I've been to virtually every court and we are able to see how that court operates, how another court operates. I've been a victim of delayed judgments, I've been a victim of all manner of things, and with light measure I have a lot of very good things to say. Before I say anything further, let me acknowledge, uh, Prof, that in our judiciary, we have some of the best legal minds. And I do not say this in flattery, because I have had the occasion in my second master's program to do a research paper on jurisprudence in apex courts all over the world, on very, very toxic or very difficult subjects that uh, that, that uh, happen in our life. This is the end of life uh, litigation. 
have looked at America, the Supreme Court of America, Supreme Court of all the countries in the world. We have fantastic judicial minds. What is it that I'll be able to bring which is not there? Access to justice was very well done by the first chief, chief justice. Second chief, chief justice did as much as he could. But access to justice is both qualitative and quantitative. It's not enough to have courthouses. It's not enough to have many judges and many magistrates and many tribunals and everything. What we now need is another transformative agenda, expeditious disposal of cases. Expeditious disposal of cases is the one that will take Kenya to the next level. It is heartening to hear of cases staying in the court processing, uh, uh, being processed in court for 10 years. We should be looking at a possibility of a case, and we can do this, and I've listened to other chief justices. I've, I'm a keen listener of the chief justice of South Africa, Mogain, Mogain, and what he's trying in South Africa is a case management system that can process a case from filing to the determination of that case. Why we must have this is because without it, we will never know statistically how well we are doing. That would be my mission and my agenda. Okay. Thank you very much, Senior Council. One last question from me. In your CV, you have said that you have avoided to be a conspicuous consumption person. Um, <laughs> uh, please explain what you meant, because uh, looking at your wealth declaration, uh, Ms. Agati, I saw very high-ed cars, uh, so isn't that conspicuous consumption, or what did you mean? <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> the, prof, <laughs> uh, conspicuous consumption has many aspects. I, I meant social circles. I, I meant that I am not in social circles. I'm not in lots of the new approaches in life. I do prefer to hold to my own. I prefer the solace of being in a library as contrasted to being in a social circles. And I must say I'm one of those lawyers who are not on the, the social media, any of the social media platforms. I would prefer to hold my peace and therefore I indicated I'm not in those social circle. Uh, uh, and I do not mean to say that those who are, are any less or doing any worse. It's a question of choice. Thank you very much. Uh, I will now request uh, uh, Commissioner Mwilu, acting CJ, to ask you further questions. Thank you. Let us conclude the discussion, Senior Council, that you have begun with the Chair on leadership. Um, and that leadership must of necessity lead to the reforms that we have already begun and which must be continued. And since you appear to admire Chief Justice Mutonga, let me start at that point. On the 19th of October 2011, when Chief Justice Mutonga was addressing the judiciary and the national clergy said the following words. <coughs> and I quote him. We found an institution so frail in its structures, so thin in resources, so low in its confidence, so deficient in integrity, so weak in its public support, that to have expected it to deliver justice was to be 
wildly optimistic. Now, we want you to please put that into context, uh, Senior Council, um, in terms of the transformation, not what has already been undertaken, but the transformation that Senior Council would progress were God to grant that Senior Council becomes the 15th Chief Justice of the Republic of Kenya. Uh, yes. Uh, Chief Justice Mutunga, I think, was being very philosophical with certain words. Being low in public support, I can see that as a direct attribute of the events two years or three years prior thereto where the public support to this institution was at its lowest level, culminating to a presidential candidate declining to have his dispute litigated in court. And with that came uh, lots of other events. And one of the issues that I would wish to deal with, and that is why I would wish to gain public support is that if a case is filed on 1st January, within that year, it should be concluded. <laughs> Commissioners have also done a little bit of reading, and we have real-life problems in this country. I saw, in, for example, in Co Costa Rica, an empirical study which has been done. If you get your criminal justice system working quickly, there is an immediate reduction in crime. But here, what we do is the exact opposite. We make our justice system work so slowly, consequently, there can be a reduction in crime. If we wish to get public support, expeditious disposal of cases becomes a very important uh, uh, thing that we must implement. Deficiency and being thin on resources, I see that happening because it's at that time of Judge, uh, Chief Justice Mutunga, I think judiciary had not had its pride of place in the Constitution. We also have the history we are dealing with. When I was joining Attorney General's chambers in 1980, judiciary was a department under the Attorney General. And that is why in the Waruhio Committee, uh, commission, he actually makes a direct recommendation. Let judiciary be away from Attorney General's chambers. Therefore, the transformation journey not only is to divest or to have judiciary stand on its own under the, new, uh, under the Constitution 2010, but to also have its own independent funding structures. And again here, DCJ, I would wish to say all those tools are provided for because there is a judiciary fund. And the Constitution of Kenya only establishes three funds, Consolidated, Judiciary Fund, and the Equalization Fund. Consequently, the framers of this Constitution want us to get away from the frail judiciary which was there in 2011 to a very robust judiciary, which is where we want or would aim to have this judiciary get into. I see Chief Justice Mutonga's words as words of hopelessness and frustration, in one word. Because across them, it is the hopelessness of the situation that he's being confronted with. Uh, senior counsel, then you would of necessity have to take us out of that hopelessness. Are we still there? <coughs> that was 2011. Uh, fast forward to 2021. Would you still describe the institution of the judiciary to be in a state of hopelessness? Far from it. We have made such tremendous progress. And therefore then, Senior Counsel, what would be the role of senior counsel, why to be chief justice, to move us from here to a place uh, better than 
what senior counsel would have found by the time senior counsel was retiring as chief justice? Uh, I see myself being in more or less the same position <coughs> as Singapore was in 1980. Singapore had a huge backlog of cases. I have done a special reading of Singapore and the backlog of cases. And within four years, and everything being equal, I'm a chief justice of four years. Within four years, Singapore did overcome that backlog. But not only the backlog, simultaneously they put in place the process or the system I am craving for, that cases are being concluded within a relatively short period of time. Today, Singapore commissioners is being cited all over the world. They did this with some assistance from the World Bank, but I do believe, with or without that assistance, they had the mentor, they had the determination to do it on their own. It's, it's one of the shining examples of what can be done within a relatively short period of time within a judiciary that really is interested in moving forward. So to answer you directly, the DCJ, I'll be the Chief Justice that will end the backlog and simultaneously have the expeditious disposal of cases, not as a theory, but as a practical thing. I would wish to see a criminal case started and within six months there is a determination. I do not, I would not want to be the Chief Justice of criminal cases staying for so long that witnesses disappear and acquittals are because of the delay in the justice system. Um, thank you. Um, I think let us pursue that a little. We have the justice chain players. How is my Lord Chief Justice Ngatia going to achieve a criminal determination within six months, will Chief Justice Ngatia force magistrates or judges to go on with hearings um, where the other justice players are not playing ball? It is advocates who at times will seek adjournments, I'm aware the court is in control or ought to be in control of the case, but there will be genuine reasons, genuine reasons for an adjournment. There'll be other maneuvers undertaken by the other justice um, players, the investigator, the prosecutor, so that the case is not ready and therefore not able to be finalized within this period of six months that uh, Senior Counsel Ngatia proposes. What then, um, and I'm going, what then, um, what then would Chief Justice Ngatia do to actually achieve a determination of criminal cases within six months? Uh, thank you, DCJ. Like everything else in life, it's not a one-man show. NCAJ becomes the first port of call. The beauty with NCAJ is that all the other players are involved. And it has got to be from NCAJ that a determination has got to be made that we must move this country forward. Judiciary actually comes at the tail end in, for example, the criminal justice system. Coming at the tail end, there's very little you can do. The investigations are done elsewhere, uh, the indictment, the charges are done elsewhere by a constitutional office holder. There's so much prior to alignment in court that becomes almost determinative to how long the process will take. So I will do my very best at NCAJ 
to say that we must take this country to another level. I would, wish, I would want to get as much cooperation from the other actors because they are real actors in this system and without their cooperation, there's nothing that can be done. But the unfortunate thing, Commissioner says this, that the person who gets the blame from the public is not those other actors, it's the judiciary. And when, for example, and I've done this as an empirical study, when adjournments are also sought by the prosecutors, and they are sought over and over again, a month goes, three, six months goes, a year goes, the person who gets the blame is the judiciary. And those who applied for adjournments do not want to say they caused a delay of one year. So it's got to be a collectivity. And the key word here is collectivity of action. And that collectivity will be at NCHA. But here, at the end of it all, is a question of whether we want to go the Singapore way, which to me is the correct way, or whether we would want to just stay with what, what we are doing, which to me is the incorrect way. We must have expeditious disposal of cases. Thank you. If senior counsel were to be chief justice, you would have, at the very least, three very core functions. There are more, but three core. But considering the whole five, or maybe six, which would senior counsel consider to be the most important role, if that is a possibility, of the holder of the office of Chief Justice, and why would that be considered to be the most important role of the office of the Chief Justice? As I look at the Constitution, my obvious answer would be the first and fundamental role of a Chief Justice is the head of the judiciary. Being the head of the judiciary has its own far-reaching consequences. You therefore become, so to speak, the titular head, not just the titular head, but the real head, the policy head of the entire judiciary. It's by virtue of being that head of the judiciary that you also have the second heart of presiding judge or the president of the Supreme Court. That role of president of the Supreme Court is a role that I have trained myself for. It's a role that can be played or can be assumed by a practitioner of my standing. And the other roles would be the other commissions, this commission being one of them, NCAJ being another one of them, Council of Law Reporting being yet another one of them, and commissioners, I do have that which it takes to be able to have enough time for all those roles. Uh, which leads me, Senior Counsel, to the next question. And it is the question of balance between the many roles that the Honorable the Chief Justice is required to, to execute. So how would Chief Justice Ngatia balance between those roles um, and what would guide uh, Chief Justice Ngatia in the balancing act between the roles? You have identified that of the, of the head of the judiciary as to you the most important one, but that must not make the others suffer. And therefore, what would be the balancing act? Part one. Part two, um, the Chief Justice, and you've mentioned that, being the President of the Supreme Court, 
must ensure in my view that that court works must ensure that as the final court what comes out of that court is indeed final in nature so that it really doesn't require explanation and so on and so forth so balance between uh, the execution of duty of the various roles of the chief justice to be able to make yourself an effective chief justice uh, thank you dcj as head of judiciary as i indicated that's a leadership role and the beauty with it is that in this judiciary we have very well established structures statutory structures which are very well established and uh, the chief registrar of the judiciary is the accounting officer it's not my role to try and micromanage that statutory duty but i do have an interest to ensure that it's well done so my first port of call would be the leadership, uh, the leadership advisory committee, because I would want to carry the entire judiciary or to be with the entire judiciary. I will regard that as my cabinet. Being my cabinet, I will be able to know what is going on in the court of appeal, in the high court, and courts of similar jurisdiction. In all probability, we should also have a magistrate with us. The CRJ is with us. Heads of directorates are with us. I would want to have very structured meetings with all of them because that is the cabinet. And with that cabinet, because I'm still ultimately the one reliable, I should be able to know what is going on at every level of this judiciary, including the Carthys courts and including how many uh, tribunals have transited and what we are doing about it, and including the improvements we can make, like small claims courts and uh, how, we, uh, how we get them going. So it's not difficult for me because I have with me a dedicated team that would, I do hope I'll be able to work with quite effectively. Uh, thank you, Senior Counsel. But if I could explain about the Supreme Court, mm -hmm. uh, because you had also asked me about the Supreme Court. Yes, please. The Supreme Court, being a collegiate court, I'll be one amongst equals. And what I'll do from day one is to personally call all the Supreme Court judges, and we shall have a meeting as equals. Collegiality commissioners does not mean, and I must say this, it does not mean that I impose my views on them. It does not mean unanimity in decisions. That's not what collegiality means. And we, uh, as a Chief Justice, I'll try to have very robust engagements by the judges. I will not stiff for them by telling them, look, let's decide this way. Sometimes, in most times, by having individual opinions is the growth of law. But if you stiff for it by having unanimity, you are not going uh, uh, very far. But of course, in such certain very divisive, divisive topics, like, say, racial segregation, you'd want to have the entire court with you. But with the ordinary cases that go to the Supreme Court, I would want the individual judges to actually show their best. If I could digress a little, we remember uh, Judge of Appeal Nyarangi, because of his individual opinion in Motoves Oridian. And we cite this to my Lord every other day, about Judge Ma Nyarangi said this, uh, and we all remember him for that. In other words, individual opinions do immortalize judges, particularly...
This is NTV. Just one capful of Dettol is enough to disinfect surfaces and protect your family and your home. Dettol, tested effective against COVID-19. Make is the bribes. Get 500 MP free Kila Siku and never miss a moment. Introducing Pushindi Cream Basso. Ushimi Cream Bar Soap with Oxy Bright removes stains effortlessly and brightens colors. Available in 1 kg and 800 gram bars and 175 gram tablets. Also available in all your favorite variants. Ushimi, a quality product from Pwani Oils. made a lot richer, thicker, tastier. Only when life goes most most, it's a lot tastier. If there's one thing that all soaps do, it's wash. From buckets to basins, bathrooms to streams, and everything in between. All soaps wash. Yes, but Protex is different. It's reinvented formula with flaxseed oil. Boosts your skin's natural anti-jam defenses by 10 times more, protecting you against 99.9% .9 of jams. So what keeps us healthy? Protex. Protex. Good health starts here. TV turning on your world. Three rights which could not be surrendered are today the rights we talk about, which, right, which cannot be alienated. But soon after John Locke came Montesquieu. Montesquieu said, even as you move from the state law, uh, state of nature, there is something you are missing. The first thing you are missing is absence of a body that can make laws. Because yes, we are moving now to a society, a community. We have an absence of a body to make laws. Next thing you are missing is an impartial judge. The third thing you are missing is somebody to enforce the laws. So Montesquieu, a French philosopher, is the one who is credited the world over by having the separation of powers. Separation of powers is not a lawyer-driven exercise or initiative. It came from these philosophers of the 17th century. That separation of powers was quickly taken over, as well as the three rights which cannot be surrendered, and the Thomas Jefferson, as you may recall, in his Declaration of Independence, he ran away with it, and in America, the Declaration of Independence, which was done, I think, in 1770-something, had the three rights, right to life, liberty, but then he twisted, Thomas Jefferson twisted the property, to, and he said, pursuit of our own happiness. So the, the Declaration of Independence of America is a direct attribute of those philosophers. I hope I have answered you uh, fully. Save for the... We would like you to say something about what Montesquieu said and which I think you have uh, sufficiently explained related to interdependence. Uh, interdependence, the beauty with interdependence, therefore, even at Montesquieu level, you have the three powers 
for lack of a better word. One creating the laws, another one the impartial judge, and another, uh, the third one enforcing. And this become the legislature, judiciary, and the executive. Uh, their interdependence is that you, as the executive, you require the laws to be enacted by legislature. And as, uh, uh, as a judiciary, you become the impartial arbiter of any dispute that will arise, either horizontally or even vertically. Uh, and in that, I, I see, as, as a matter of fact, that is the same thing that is today known as the separation of powers within our constitution. The interdependence meaning that you are not isolated. Could I say this? Judiciary is not created for itself. Judiciary is created as a service industry to the people of Kenya. So if it's understood we are service industry for the people of Kenya, we are not created for ourselves, then we become interdependent because the people we are serving are the people of the Republic of Kenya. Both executive, both legislature, and more important, the, 20, the 47 million or 40 something million of our citizens. That is our core business. Thank you, Senior Council. I have two final questions. And the first one will be as follows. Would you say that the jurisprudence emerging from the Supreme Court confirms the transformative nature of the Constitution or it belies it? And while there, while still at the Supreme Court, the Supreme Court has exclusive original jurisdiction to hear and determine disputes relating to the elections of the office of the President arising out of Article 140 of the 2010 Constitution. Uh, please, with the reference to Section 83 of the Elections Act, the various amendments thereto, since 2016, and any other relevant jurisprudence that comes to your mind, Senior Counsel, please discuss the role of the Supreme Court in the nullification or confirmation of a presidential election. And please tell us whether that jurisdiction should rest in the Supreme Court and what the challenges of hearing that important case are to the judiciary as a whole. Ah, DCJ, <laughs> you put me in a small fix, but I'll navigate. I'll definitely navigate these very difficult areas. The first one is easy. Supreme Court has come up with some very transformative judgments. Very, very transformative. Let me say this. The Muruateto case, although misunderstood and misapplied by courts in Kenya, has won the pride of place all over the world. I do not have, but I can provide to the chief registrar I was just going through my searches around Moruateto. It is quoted with approval in Barbados. A whole paragraph of Moruateto is quoted with approval. Not just Moruateto, but a whole paragraph of how the Supreme Court came to arrive at a decision that a mandatory death penalty is an illegality. But having said so, I think I could say a word or two about it. In Muruateto, which I had occasion to argue, the question was not about death penalty as such. The question was about a colonial relic. In 1938, the colonial masters 
inserted section 204 in the penal code. They did the same in other colonies, in Malawi, Zambia, Belize, a few other colonies. But at the time of independence, those other countries had amended their law. But in Kenya, 40, 50 years later, we still have this section 204. My attack was on a mandatory death penalty, not the question whether a death penalty is constitutionally viable. It could be viable. But a mandatory death penalty means that we are sharing our judicial power with the National Assembly. Judicial power cannot be shared. The unfortunate thing, commissioners, is this. I think Supreme Court didn't make it as explicit as it could that this applies only to Section 204. For the simple reason, the Supreme Court thought you can bring into place other actors, like Attorney General, to come with proposals. Hopefully, after they have come with proposals, then Supreme Court will give further directions. As fate would have it in this country, there is a word called rethargy, and after a year, the year that Supreme Court thought that the report would be there, there was no such report. I, I lost track with the Muruateto case. But I do know as a fact that what Supreme Court would have wanted to do was not done because the other players in that who are defined by name failed to do that which they were supposed to do. But it's not too late. In the event that you honor me with this position, I'll immediately get to Muruateto see how the judges who could hear it or to come to terms with how we now do not allow it to be a way of people running away from what are otherwise valid sentences. Murate to uh, senior counsel is one case, another one that is transformative? Uh, another case which would have been transformative but didn't become as transformative as I thought was the arbitration appeals. Because we lost the opportunity of Kenya attracting arbitrations from all over the world, like other countries have. Uh, that case was going towards making arbitration insular from judicial intervention. The Supreme Court almost reached there, but backed out by saying that go back to Supreme Court and let Supreme Court see whether it was. So we, we, uh, 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 those are the two that would immediately come to mind. All as right. regards, mm -hmm. as regards presidential election petitions, could I start off with the challenges? The first challenge every Kenyan would say is the 14 days. It's not a challenge. We have done it three times. We have done it because lawyers in this country do believe that you can do tasks within a relatively short period of time. I say this in contradistinction to what happened in Zambia. In Zambia in 2016, they have the same law. The lawyers took 10 days exchange of papers, another two days case discussions and case conference, and they remembered they have not had their case on the 14th day. So the presidential petition was not heard. It was not heard because they started saying that can there be extension of time? Needless to say, the lawyer for the successful party said it's cast in stone, it's cast in the constitution. So I do not see that as a major problem. Section 83, DCJ, uh, in 2013, it was applied fully. It's on the basis of Section 83 that the election was upheld substantially. Come 2017, there were difficulties. The court, the majority decision did not apply. As I remember, Section 83, dissenting judgment, I believe, of Judge, Supreme Court Judge Joki dealt with it. 
But then there was an amendment by National Assembly. Many things were done. The amendments have been struck off, I remember, by one of the petitions by Katiba Institute. So we are in fairly murky waters about the application of Section 83. We should start hearing that case, uh, Senior Counsel. Sorry? Which court should... A presidential petition, I would, without reservation, say, should be the sole preserve of the Supreme Court. Reasons? Uh, we have a lot of similar jurisdiction. Malawi, as you know, has the similar jurisdiction. They nullified the presidential petition, I think, last year. Uh, if we do presidential petition in any other court, then there will be issues about appellate processes. I do believe Supreme Court is, has won its pride of place by having dealt with three presidential petitions, and in all three, the actors may have had reservations, but by and large, this now an established jurisprudence of the Supreme Court. <coughs> now, um, to my final question. Um, right now, as we are sitting here, there's the debate whether or not the 15th Chief Justice of the Republic of Kenya ought to come from inside or from outside, the insider, outsider debate. What is your view of a practitioner, in effect an outsider, at this particular time coming to head this very important institution. Uh, justify your answer with uh, some basis, and that will be my last question to you, Senior Counsel. Uh, thank you, DCJ. Maybe let me start with the last. United States of America, which has the pride or prides itself as being the most liberal democracy, from 1896. To 1953 had racial segregation as part of its judicial policy. Schools were on a racial basis. A black boy, black girl will go to a black school. Similarly, a white girl, white boy will go to another school. Public transport was in the same way. Supreme Court in that country was divided for over 70 years. They had several judges, eminent judges, eminent chief justices. They could not see that segregation is an archaic practice. 1953, General Eisenhower nominated Warren as the chief justice. Let's look at Warren. Warren was a very successful lawyer, had conducted numerous prosecu prosecutions in the United States of America. He was one of the most brilliant lawyers America has had, had seen. He then transitioned to be the governor of California. Wa was a governor, I think, for two or three terms. In 1952, this Warren man was so popular he thought he could stand as a president and sought the nomination of the Republican Party. He was defeated by Eisenhower. He subsequently became the Chief Justice of the United States of America. I emphasize this insider-outsider difference how difficult it then becomes. Warren is coming from a lawyer who was a, became a governor. He has never held a judicial position, didn't have the long, longevity of private practice like I've had, and he became the chief justice. 
And then the question came in his court about racial segregation. Brown decision. Warren marshaled all his colleagues and they had a unanimous verdict that there can never be racial segregation in the United States of America. Something that had been unable to be done by chief justices, career, chief, uh, career judges, who had been appointed as chief justices. Sam Warren, you remember in the, uh, in the next case, loving against uh, Virginia, you could not marry a cross-racial barrier. A black boy could not marry a black girl. And Warren came with this very beautiful uh, uh, sentence that love resides in your heart. And a moon, a no state has the business entering your heart. Unanimous verdict. He managed to defeat racial segregation in the United States of America by his judgments. Look at the first judgment by Warren. This of racial segregation in public schools and transport, 12 page, 12 pages of brilliance. All right, uh, Senior Council, we have heard about Warren. Uh, now tell us why the, are you saying the outsider therefore is better than the insider? N no, I'm not saying it's, there's anybody who is better than the other. Uh -huh. My point is this, please look at merit. Please, let's not have this distinction in JSC as my plea to you that there is anybody who is an outsider, there is anybody who is an insider. The hours I have spent in judiciary before Supreme Court came here, this was our high court, honorable commissioners, this was our high court. I've spent more hours in the library here, I've spent more hours in court here than cumulatively a few judges have spent in their judicial life. In other words, I do not see it as a correct description to call a practitioner an outsider. I prefer you call him a, you, uh, a consumer of judicial service. No, definitely not an outsider. I'm as much part of you, I hope I will not be rejected, as much part of you <laughs> at all times because I con I'm a consumer of your service and I represent the people who actually become the beneficiaries of judicial service. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much, um, Senior Council. Just a small clarification. Um, I took an interest in your answer uh, uh, by the question from DCJ on this Verus of Accord. Is it a month? Montesky? Montesky. 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 Yes. And, and you answered very well. You answered uh, very well, really giving an academic answer. And, and my question is, Senior Counsel, is this philosopher someone who any lawyer would uh, remember what they said from their judiciary philosophy class, or is it that you read a lot of philosophy? Uh, uh, pro professor, I will say this without any fear. I did a bachelor's degree in law, University of Nairobi, a master's degree in law from possibly the second best university in the United Kingdom. We never learned philosophy. I learned philosophy in Strathmore in my next, my, uh, my second master's. Philosophy therefore becomes one of the most important tools that you must have, particularly if you're going to any leadership skill, leadership position. Montesquieu and all other philosophers, Thomas Aquinas and everybody from medieval times. And if I could, with your permission, the first trial was of Socrates. And you know, probability, my uh, attorney general may recall, the first trial in 399 BC was of Socrates in the city of Athens. And those are the things you learn in philosophy. It broadens your knowledge, it broadens your judicial approach, and lastly, it gives you a complete, a very complete world view of the law and the people that you are to serve. No, that, that's okay. I just took an interest because of the way you answered it. But now, uh, Thank you, Prof. 
Um, I'll now request uh, um, Honorable Commissioner uh, Mohammed Wasame Judge to continue the technical questions. Thank you, Professor. Uh, senior Counsel, from what you have stated, you are a successful advocate and you have practiced law for quite some time. I want to know and understand what motivated you to apply for the position of CJ and what you are looking for and what values, both in terms of administrative leader, jurisprudential leader, you bring on board. Thank you, my lord. Uh, Chief Justice before 2010, I would not have been interested. Chief Justice after 2010, I'll be interested. Interested to serve. I emphasize interested to serve for the following reasons. Post 2010, the Chief Justice is really a leader and a transformative leader. A leader who will never take us back to the state of nature that we almost experienced in 2008. A leader to take this country to a level that we can now compete with our equals in the world. What values do I bring? My Lord, I bring the following values. Ethics is one of my core attributes. I'll bring ethical values into this judiciary. Ethics not in terms of saying do and don't, but to inculcate a culture, a culture that we know we are there to serve. To inculcate a culture of work, correct work ethic. Correct work, work ethic is not something you legislate. It's something you almost, so to speak, fellowship with the fellow judges. And we agree that really let us be servants of the people who have given us this power. This judicial power is derived to us or given to us by the people of Kenya. We are trustees. Let us not abuse that trust. I'll bring all those values. I'll bring the values of hard work. I, allow me to say this, my Lord. In this career that you have referred to as a su successful, it is a career that I have managed because of one word, perseverance. And for any lawyers, wherever they may be, young lawyers particularly, I would want to tell them this. This legal career, if one is starting, you do it brick by brick. There are no instant successes. And equally for the judiciary, I would wish to have discussions with judges at JTI and to see that really by peer review we can even improve our reasoning in judgments and rulings. Those are the, some of the values that I believe I'll bring. Thank you I'll very bring much. that value of continuous reading of beyond law, philosophy, and other di disciplines. Thank you, my lord. Uh, you have also talked about the impressive CV of Mutunga and Maraga, what they did as Chief Justice. Uh, because of the 2010 Constitution. Uh, having served also in the judiciary even before them, I was also very impressed with Evans Gisheru as Chief Justice. Uh, that's for your information. JSC is looking for a Chief Justice who can take the judiciary to the next generation after Mutunga, after Maraga. I want you to share with the Commission from your experience and knowledge Three institutional weakness, if any, in the judiciary that you will address so that you can take the judiciary to the next level. Three institutional weaknesses. Uh, before I go to the three, uh, my lord, Chief Justice Gesheru and other Chief Justices also did beautiful work. I was here when Judge, Chief Justice Madan uh, uh, was the Chief Justice, Chief Justice Coker, 
I have, I have worked under them. They did wonderful work under difficult circumstances. But those circumstances are no longer with us. The, ex the structural difficulties which were there are no longer there. Some of the, and I say this not as a condemnation, we still have weaknesses in delivery of or conclusion of cases. Conclusion of cases is still bedeviling us in a very major way. Hearing of cases is also something that is still a challenge. ICT, as my Lord is aware, we have done, and I must say this, it is my heart to judiciary, we have overcome the mental barrier. Most of us had a mental barrier that ICT cannot work. We have overcome that barrier. We now know ICT can work. All we need to do is add capacity and we are almost there. And with ICT, uh, with other human skills, human resources, will be more or less on the way to the next level. Thank you very much. Uh, now let's go to the difficult issue. This is Raila 2013, which in my view is spearheaded a critical uh, legislative reform in the election laws that included the incorporation of uh, technology in our elections. Uh, but one of the critics of that decision is what the court called the timely filings of election petitions. And you are involved in this case. The court rejected that voluminous affidavit by the petitioner, which was filed, in my view, within uh, the, which was not filed within the seven, it was not filed with the petition, but it was filed before the determination or the hearing of the, of uh, the petition. Are you a chief justice who will give broader interpretation to filing of petitions, such that if somebody f feels he has filed the petition within the seven days, but there are critical issues which needs to be brought before the court and is brought before the determination of the decision, are you a chief justice who will allow broader determination, broader interpretation such that justice is served to all litigants who come before the Supreme Court, especially in presidential petitions? Uh, my Lord, as you indicated, is a difficult question, but uh, we can actually answer this on principles of the Constitution. The first principle, my Lord, is that we have 14 days for Supreme Court to decide. Or let's start a little earlier. From the declaration of the resort, an aggrieved party has seven days, seven solid days. Put your act together. So the petitioner has a very big advantage, and I would want to be understood in this very well. Petitioner has seven days from declaration of resort. A petitioner who is desirous or who considers that if all doesn't work well, I'll be petitioning Supreme Court, has another almost five days at Bombers of Kenya, where a collation of results is taking place. So cumulatively, a petitioner who is diligent has 12 days to put his house together. The respondent has a very short period to answer hundreds and hundreds of volumes of pages. And my Lord, as you indicated, I've had the advantage or I've had the privilege of handling this. It is not once or twice. I had, together with my legal team, less than two hours of sleep per day. Because you are dealing with massive accusations, massive innuendos, and massive everything. So the respondent actually is disadvantaged. By the time of filing this, you have Supreme Court, per the Constitution, has 14 days. My Lord, let's agree 
that is cast in stone. It's not elastic. If you are to allow the same petitioner who had 12 days to put his act together to be able to come with another affidavit that would require me another three or four days to respond, my Lord, you take, your, you take us to Zambia. We go directly to Zambia where the judges realized on the 14th day that our time is up and we have not had these characters. It's a dangerous thing. So, my Lord, it's not even a, uh, being broader interpretation. It is simply this. Unless there is any amendment, the 14 days is the day the Supreme Court must hear and determine. So you cannot uh, uh, have the luxury of allowing one party more latitude than the other. Allow me to say this, my Lord. If a petition, if Father Affidavit was allowed, principles of natural justice, I would have been given corresponding time to respond. If I'm given corresponding time to respond of the 14 days, then we'll start a hearing on the 11th or 12th or 14th day. It's not possible for a hearing to be done. Okay. Another critique leveled at the court in 2013, the Raila case, is that the court is allowed within 14 days to hear and determine the election petition. But on the 14th day or on the 13th day, the court renders one paragraph judgment. In essence, people are saying, and the decision is rendered maybe after one month or two months, the court is enlarging the constitutional timelines by not rendering the full and the final judgment of the court. Are you achieve justice? Who will ensure? Judges of the Supreme Court render their judgment on the 14th day or on the 13th day as provided for under the Constitution. Yes, my Lord. Uh, and, and this goes, depends really from, uh, now I speak as a practitioner, different styles by judges. I've been before quite a few of your brothers and sisters particularly of yesteryear, who at the conclusion of the case will come up with a decision of the case and say reasons to be provided later. I've, I've had that experience. And I would agree with you, the problem with that is this. I do not know for certainty why the decision went the way it is. I think the middle ground is this. I'll borrow heavily from Warren. You do not need a PhD or a master's as a judgment in any case. In, in Warren, in the Brown case, it was a 12 page and it was sufficiently well reasoned to be a judgment. If given the opportunity as a Chief Justice, I would endeavor to my utmost to have a reasoned judgment within the 14 days. Again, let's come to Raila 2017, Raila 1 2017. The petition was invalidated on the interpretation of Section 83. And uh, the court accorded the section a disjunctive interpretation. Given, and, uh, given the use of the word or, and the later after the decision there was an attempt by Parliament to replace the word or with under, which was rejected, as you correctly said, by the Court of Appeal through an application made by Katiba. As a Chief Justice, are you a Chief Justice who, because the, court, the Supreme Court is allowed through majority decision to depart from its earlier decision, are you a Chief Justice who will depart from that position because your position that time was the conjunctive interpretation should be given to Section 83. I know it's a difficult, <laughs> but you have the liberty to answer. <laughs> My Lord, you place me in an awkward situation where, you know, probability, the emerging <laughs> political formations are listening to this. 
I'll approach that court with a very open mind. Neither conjunctive nor disjunctive, I'll listen to them, oblivious of what my arguments there before were. And there's a lot, there's a lot to be said about this. The minute I take my judicial office, my, my oath of office, it becomes a divorce, the cut of your biblical cord between Gatia practitioner and Gatia chief justice. It is a dicey issue, or has been argued and I have argued, or can mean to, as an and, and it has been argued to the contrary. I'll be a chief justice who listen to legal arguments, oblivious of what I may have argued before, and rule in accordance with the Constitution. Okay, let's come to the simple issues. In your first annual address, the soldier address to the people of Kenya, tell us three messages you will convey to the people of Kenya in major areas that you feel the judiciary is lacking or is of concern to you? Uh, I will not approach the people of Kenya with an alarmist statement that the judiciary is lacking anything. My first statement will be that you have a judiciary that is capable and is, has been delivering very good service. I will be actually a chief justice who tell the people of Kenya, we are here to serve you. But I'll go further and indicate areas that we shall progressively work with them and make this judiciary even more profound in their day-to-day -day activities. I'll tell them the days of paying cash at the registry are days gone. We do not want so much interface with people. And I'll tell them in 2011, the revenue that we collected is 500 million. Last year, I think it was 2.8 billion. So I'll tell them, let's have more faith in technology. It's much easier for you to pay through an M-Pesa. I'll also tell them that there's this perceived rot in the judiciary, your file is missing. We are going to work together to have a digital filing system, the e-filing system. And I'll tell them that very soon, we'll try to have even courthouses to be able to do e-filing for litigants in person. And I will explain to them the beauty with e-filing is that from the comfort of your phone, you can see how your case is progressing. In other words, my Lord, I'll be not a chief justice, to condemn judiciary, I'll be a chief justice to show Kenyans that we are here as their servants and we are going to take the judiciary to the same level, if not higher, than what Singapore has achieved. Thank you. And lastly, Senior Counsel, your solution for the 41 judges. And I wish you well. <laughs> uh, my Lord, 41 judges, they are now 40 out of attrition, uh, there are many solutions to it. The solution of a discussion would be the best. Failing a discussion, I would do my very, very level best. But my message would be this. I need all hands on deck. Without hands on deck, I will not be able to achieve. So the approach would be let us find a solution. Let us not find, let's not deal so much with the legalistic positions, much as they may end up with the result or the other. I please, I would say, I need hands on deck. I am a captain. I'm handicapped. And there are difficult winds ahead, difficult storms ahead. I need all hands on deck. Thank you, Prof. Thank you very much, Judge uh, Wasame. Thank you, Senior Counsel. It's now the turn of Honorable Judge, my Judge and Commissioner, to continue with the questioning. Uh, thank you, Chair, and uh, welcome, Senior Counsel. Um, I am looking at your sample writings. Uh, you presented six of them, some of the cases you have done, and two dissertations. 
and I would praise you that they are very, very well written. Uh, but before I uh, touch on some of them, I just want to follow up from where my two colleagues have left. Uh, starting with what uh, the uh, acting Chief Justice spoke about insider, outsider. Kenya has had, uh, the, the judiciary has been in existence in Kenya for over a century, 1897 up to date. We have never had a woman Chief Justice. So the issue now we are confronted with is to say this position must be for a woman. Just the way there are those who are saying inside outsider, there are some who are saying now we want a woman to be Chief Justice. So what is your response to that? Uh, as my Lord appreciates, <laughs> I've, I've never had uh, the honor to be in a decision-making forum like JSC. Notwithstanding, let me go back to what happened not very many years ago, within our lifetime, 1963. Kenya was at the same level with Ghana and with Singapore. Same level. We were at par. Singapore said we are going to have meritocracy as our guide. Kenya and Ghana did not. Singapore, within our lifetime, is in the first world. We are still in the third world. And our brothers in Ghana still in the third world. I will not be gender driven in such an important process such as this. I am not here to say that a lady is not sufficient as a chief justice, but I will look for a leader, be it male or female. I, I will not, so to speak, discriminate because by discrimination, I would have even gone against the Constitution. The most merited person, be it a person of disability or whatever, is what I think JSC would go for. And I keep on repeating Singapore because these are things, transformations in that little place that have happened within one lifetime. There's no other country that within one lifetime have moved from third world to first world. And I listened to the Prime Minister, the five secrets of Singapore. Secret number one is meritocracy. Secret number one, meritocracy. So here I am to answer you directly, my lord. If I was looking for a judge, I will look for judge so, so and so who fits that description because it's the legal mind I'm looking for. Be it a lady or a man, would be a secondary consideration. Okay. Uh, I, I, I note you have also uh, read a lot of philosophy. I haven't. That's why I'm unable to um, engage with you at that level. But probably tell us um, one female um, philosopher, uh, one female uh, person who has done a lot on, of ethics that uh, you would think has made an important contribution to this area of law uh, we are dealing with? Uh, there, there are quite a number of lady philosophers. I may not recall them by name, uh, but even at Strathmore, uh, my lecturer, who I think is the head of the department, is a lady. I'll try to remember her name be Gish okay. Gishura, I think, okay. uh, Professor Gishura, a lady, uh, one of the very best philosophers that ever taught me. Okay, thank yes. you. Uh, the, the, the other question uh, which arises from what uh, uh, the chair talked to you about, uh, what the chair raised and what we were talking about, the next generation. Uh, in my view, the next generation of this country is the youth. Uh, we know, for example, 60 percent, and maybe I'm wrong, maybe I'm right, 60 percent will be young people, people under the age of 35. 
In fact, uh, it is projected that for the next 10, 10, 15 years, we will have a very youthful country. And that presents uh, to the next Chief Justice a huge challenge. Uh, because you have to cut, you said you are a service, you have to cut to that demographic. I was a bit concerned when you say that um, I, I, you use the word ostentatious. Uh, there is a word you used mm -hmm. that says you are closed, uh, you are not part of social media, that is for other people. <laughs> but one of the threats <laughs> judiciaries worldwide and, and, and states have identified, and even our Supreme Court has identified, is the whole issue of information and disinformation in this age. Given your, your position as the Chief Justice, are you the kind of Chief Justice who is willing to engage on that platform that is accessible to what is now the majority of Kenyans? Uh, uh, thank you, my lord. Supreme Court of United Kingdom, and uh, I'm sure my lord will be able to see this uh, during the break. Supreme Court of United Kingdom has possibly the best web page I have ever seen. Supreme Court of United Kingdom. With the click of a button, you are able to see all the outstanding cases, all the cases that have been decided, and actually what the holdings are. It is something we must try to have. It's so educative, so interactive, that you can actually go click to, say, a particular case on Brexit or whatever, and even get the lawyer's arguments in that case. That is the Supreme Court of United Kingdom. We must have that. What because about you, as the Chief Justice, head of the judiciary, who people look up to? Uh, I was to go to the next thing. Supreme Court of United Kingdom has a Twitter handle with hundreds of followers. My Lord, as a Chief Justice, I'd have no difficulty with engaging. The engagement I think I was talking about are the engagements that you see which are sometimes with respect, very abusive, unnecessary, that have become more or less the nature of the day. I belong to a little older culture that when you leave court, you don't start addressing the media about your arguments and everything. I'm of that culture that had a bit of restraint because we, if we do not also have restraint, my lord, then I don't know where we'll be going to. But if you could allow me to just say one word about the youth. I have a message for you, for the youth, particularly the young lawyers. We have hundreds, prof, hundreds of young lawyers who have no livelihood. Judiciary must change its style. We must also take part in development of this country. My, I, my mission or, or my view would be that we start having innovation hubs in our courts. All we'll need is a room, have several desks, have Wi-Fi, and these young men and women can be able to do their research. That is one of the messages I would have for the young lawyers. And of course, start over at Pirate, at maybe Milimani, yes. and uh, have it across board. Mm. And finally, just to follow up with what my brother, Commissioner Watsame, spoke about, the 41 judges, and I, I just want to relate this to an issue of self-sacrifice. Are you willing, if we nominate you to be the Chief Justice, then you are approved by, uh, appointed by the President, approved by the National Assembly. Are you willing to tell the President, uh, before you swear me, I would like you to swear the 41 judges. Is that a sacrifice you are willing to make? as a prospective Chief Justice? <laughs> Judge Majanja, you are one of the... <laughs> Cross examination is very incisive. I do not think it's possible uh, to have uh, 
a condition spelled out to the appointing authority, I think it will be disrespectful. But at the same time, I'll make it as important as my swearing in. In other words, my Lord, I do not see it befitting to say you must do this before you do this. But I think in the order of priority is to prioritize both events. To say that, please, as you appoint me the captain, you disable me by not having the hands on, on deck. Uh, that way, I think, would be more efficient and more effective than going with conditions precedent, as we call them in your court, conditions precedent. Okay. So it's not good to go with conditions precedent. Yes. Uh, another question, uh, and this is on the Muruatetu. I heard you say uh, that uh, Muruatetu has been applied. Am I correct? You said it has been misapplied. 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 Can you tell us the instances it has been been misapplied? Uh, it's been applied or misapplied in sexual offenses, robbery with violence, and very many other cases. Uh, and why do you say so? Uh, the, 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 the Supreme Court was dealing with Section 204. I know judicial officers say by parity of reasoning, by parity of reasoning. Also, by parity of reasoning is a tool lawyers use, is a tool with certain shortfalls. Because the parity of reasoning cannot be the same for sexual offenses, parliament or national assembly, in my view, is perfectly entitled to say because of the prevalence of this offense will give a minimum sentence. And parliaments all over the world have done that. Uh, but you said uh, in your same discussion, th the reason why you challenged this law, and again, uh, I'm quoting, you said, your argument leading to the unconstitutionality was that the judiciary cannot share power, judicial power, with the legislature. Correct. Th that's the, that is the principle upon which two or four fell to that extent. Correct. So what is the difference between sharing power with the judiciary in mandatory death uh, uh, penalty and sharing power with mandatory sexual... And it's not only mandatory sexual offenses, it's Forestry Act, for example. <laughs> uh, the old woman who is... Uh, in the forest, she's found with firewood, and she's told she has to go to jail or pay 50,000 shillings. So what is the difference in the... Is, 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 is the issue the principle or the issue the offense? That we can pick and choose the offense, but remain with the principle? Uh, my Lord, it's, there, are two different, or, there are two different situations here. In murder cases, you have a one sentence fit all. We know as lawyers that no two murders are the same. So to have your life extinguished on conviction of murder, notwithstanding extenuating circumstances, is to have an, a sentence to fit all circumstances. In other legislations, penal legislations, I am of the view that depending on the prevalence of a particular occurrence, National Assembly may be within their power to indicate, for example, that for this offense, you pay a fine not exceeding this. So it's not a co-sharing of power. What Parliament is saying is that there is so much of prevalence of this issue, but I, I must also indicate to you, my lord, that is not something I have ever argued. My arguments were limited to section 204. Okay. So uh, I'll, I'll just uh, ask now, uh, going back to your readings, which I said are excellent. I have no problem with them, but Thank just you. to raise a few issues. Um, you were in the Okemo um, extradition case. Yes, I was. Uh, and I'm not talking about the merits. 
This case started in 2011. It started uh, 2011. 2013, a petition was filed in the High Court. 2015, uh, Judge Lenola gave a judgment. Uh, you appealed in 2016. 2018, um, Court of Appeal gave its decision. Uh, that's a period of seven years. And if it went to the Supreme Court, probably it would take two or three years. So that must be an issue. If you become the Chief Justice, that would be an issue for concern to you that an extradition case running through the system would take an average of seven, eight, nine years. Probably just tell us one intervention, one intervention you would make to deal with this kind of situation, particularly in this kind of cases where international interests are involved. Uh, it, it's, uh, my Lord, it's, it's a question of sometimes of a good case management. If judges were to conference, you may be able to actually see that the issue raised is a single issue. Without going to the merits, as you indicated, it's a single issue pending for determination in the Supreme Court. Namely, between AG and DPP, who has the legal power? It's not something that ought to take years. It's a single issue appeal. And I sometimes make my appeal so easy. As so um, I'm, I'm, I'm talking about the process. Uh, so what would you do in that situation? It, it's, if it started with the correct case management at the high court, it was the same issue. It didn't require lots and lots of hours to argue. It was a single issue. And Judge Renaura decided it. He was overruled by the Court of Appeal. And we are waiting now for the Apex Court. Okay. Um. This is NTV. Introducing Ushindi Cream Basso. Ushindi Cream Basso with Oxy Bright removes stains effortlessly and brightens colors. Available in 1 kilogram and 800 gram bars and 175 gram tablets. Also available in all your favorite variants. Ushindi, a quality product from Pwani Oils. made a lot richer, thicker, tastier. Only when life goes mosmos, it's a lot tastier. Vaseline Skin Care. Vaseline has a triple purified formula that creates a layer that locks in moisture, which allows your skin to heal from within. Vaseline applied before you sleep can help restore your face's natural level of moisture and softness. To keep skin restored, that's the healing power of Vaseline. Every mom, you want the best for your child. Happy birthday. You make sure she knows the joy of sharing happy moments with family. And when everything comes together, you above all others will share the taste of success with her. Blue Band tastes like mama's love. Just one capful of Dettol is enough to disinfect surfaces and protect your family and your home. Dettol, tested effective against COVID-19. 
Fact Finder from the BBC. Just how free is the media in Botswana? We tell you what we found out. Fake, fake, disgusting news. How a term popularized by Donald Trump rose to prominence during the Nigerian elections thanks to WhatsApp. We speak to one of the influential voices on Ghanaian airwaves and found out what makes her tick. And we look at how new technology transformed outside broadcasts here at the BBC back in 1948. Wow, thank you for your time. How juicy. Juicy. Vaseline Skin Care. Vaseline has a triple purified formula that creates a layer that locks in moisture, which allows your skin to heal from within. Vaseline applied before you sleep can help restore your face's natural level of moisture and softness. To keep skin restored, that's the healing power of Vaseline. Make it the bright. Get 500 MP free Kila Siku and never miss a moment. This is NTV. When you have some time, please look at the holding scene both. In synergy, the final word is go back to, so, to, high, to court of appeal for hearing on merits. That, that's dispositive, the dispositive part of it. In Newton, which I conducted, is slightly different. We are told, go back to, to Court of Appeal, but this guy must establish in limine, making it like a preliminary hearing, whether he was entitled or his appeal lies within Section 35. So that's why you see that synergy has been processed by Court of Appeal and determined. Nyoto has not, because Nyoto must go through a, a hearing in limine before it is admitted. So in my respectful submission, a lot of very difficult areas have been uh, 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 within Nyoto. How will you have this preliminary hearing within a hearing? Um, and so would you... In, in, so in your own view, the Chief Justice's dissent would have been a better decision. You shut that door and call it a day. Uh, well, I, I won't go as far as that because I'll be saying that to have a, a partisan interest. Mm. But the Chief Justice's dissent yes. is very, very powerful. It's a very powerful dissent. Yes. And as we have seen in our judicial development, sometimes the dissent becomes the voice after some years. Now, yeah, you have practiced for many years. And when you practice for many years, they, you, you, you become steeped in the traditions, the arcana of common law. Uh, and Justice Willie Mutunga um, then says that part of our challenge of judicial transformation is common law capture. We are captured by the common law. And for those of you who have practiced, some of us who have written, common law is a beautiful thing, but it is capture. It restrains us from transforming uh, our law, decolonizing. As the Chief Justice and leader of the Supreme Court, what are some of the ideas you have in terms of surmounting the common law capture in order to transform our jurisprudence? Uh, yes, my lord. The common law capture is because that is what lawyers are taught. 
at first tire system. The first tire being our first interaction with the law faculty. But as we progress, if we progress, we start finding that that capture or that information we got is not really the correct information. I have traveled and I have lawyers I work with. For example, in India, and actually you, you may be surprised, my lord, we are not very dissimilar. I think it's Article 20, yes, artic, uh, Article 22, which provides that dealing with the Bill of Rights, the court should not be restricted by procedural technicalities. Should not be restricted by te uh, procedural technicalities. That is in our Constitution. Despite this, you still find, because of that capture you have indicated, courts here still require elaborate pleadings to be made. In India, we have what they call PIL, Public Interest Litigation Based on the Constitution. And this, that litigation can be done as informally as the court itself calling for the minister to appear before them and explain a constitutional infraction. So I am not captured. I am within the development of the constitution that we must now give way to the modern way of doing things. Okay. And the constitution has already given us this. Uh, uh, and, and in fact, in your, in your thesis, eh, this one on... Uh, legal uh, difficulty of delimiting the Kenya-Sudan boundary, uh, which is now prescient as we are dealing with other boundary issues. Maybe you would have been the lead counsel. But the... the, the <laughs> Attorney General <laughs> didn't appoint me. <laughs> uh, but the, the, there is a um, quote here that, uh, you, you know, attracted me, and maybe I'll just read it to you and ask you. Say, psych sociological and the geographical... Um, considerations are discussed briefly, not because they are unimportant, but they must be regarded as peripheral to legal consideration, which forms the main thesis of this paper. Uh, what I wanted just to ask is, apart from the law, are there other phenomena, uh, other considerations that affect the law that are actually relevant in the way you interpret and read the Constitution. Yes, my Lord, as I've indicated in that paper, sociological considerations are so important. As a matter of fact, the Supreme Court Act, Section 3, talks of developing a rich Kenyan jurisprudence. So, we, we, much as we look all over the world, our bearing, or if I were to use navigational terms, the beacon, the beacon for Supreme Court is to try and develop a Kenyan jurisprudence. So sociolo sociological considerations become important. Anthropology becomes important. We are who we are because of what, where we have come from. Okay. Those are things that we must start interacting with because just interacting with abstract legal issues, our apex court will not grow. And in your other uh, dissertation on euthanasia, again, very well done. I've learned a lot from it. And one thing I've realized, it was an empirical study. Yes. And you found that, in fact, uh, euthanasia is widespread, but under the table, uh, widespread. And you were trying to ask, why is it being done? Um, this is the same issue with abortion, isn't it? Correct. It's widespread, but it's all under the table. Yes. So, the right to life is provided for in the Constitution. Um, it is there. It is also, and the right to life begins at conception. But one of the interesting things in the Constitution is that that life may be taken away by written law. Written law. So, Parliament has the, 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 the space to legislate when life can be taken away and it can 
actually, if it wished, it could permit euthanasia and other, other forms of how life can be taken away. But what I want to ask you is this. First, if Parliament passes a law, what are the kind of standards, constitutional standards, values, principles, can you discern from the Constitution itself that that law must be judged by uh, to uh, pass the constitutional master? Yes, uh, the beginning point is Parliament cannot pass a law which is illegal. Parliament must pass a law that is within the law. And discussing this from the point of the paper that I wrote, allow me to indicate a little bit more. Euthanasia became what it is in the United Kingdom because of a decision by Justice Kennedy in the Planned Parenthood case. I'm sure you're aware of that. In the Planned, Pla uh, Planned Parenthood case, Justice Kennedy said that with, it's within you to decide what you can do with your body. In other words, your body is your self-project. And he used very flowery language uh, to, the, uh, to, the, to mean um, a person is like self-regulating and you have every right with your body. And that determination by Justice Kennedy had a direct influence to euthanasia, to abortion, to all the things that subsequently happened. My view is this. Philosophy now comes to regulate our life. Is man a self-project or is man beyond a self-project? And that is answered in philosophy. If you look at Jeremy Bentham, he considers man to be sovereign. You consider other philosophers, they say no. Man is not sovereign, you live within your image. But fortunately for us, we go to our own philosophers. I am who I am because we are. <laughs> uh, but you, you have still not answered my question. My question is, eh? uh, Parliament passes a law. By, because this is going to happen. In fact, Parliament may pass a law. There will be people running to your court to say this is unconstitutional. Parliament will not pass a law. But the constitutional, uh, for example, recognizes that there is a right to abortion and people will still knock at your door. So what are the values, just tell us what are the values, the principles that guide that line between what you think or what the law or what the constitutional value places on life and what it places on the person. Can you just... That is I, what I, I, I will be guided by the constitution, oh. my lord, uh -huh. uh, because the, the beauty with it is that it's not so much of a view, but what the constitution provides. So if constitution were to say that life begins at this point and life can only be taken away through an act of parliament, then that act must measure to the constitutional master of a valid law. At what instances could that life be taken? Okay. Yes. Finally, uh, you agree with me that um, you, you talked about uh, perceptions are important in terms of um, independence of the judiciary, in terms of accountability. We, we must deal with perceptions. So I'll ask you what I consider probably a personal questions. You represented His Excellency the President in the petitions that we have had. Correct. So obviously, there is a public out there who feel that if Fred Ngatia is appointed as Chief Justice, he's very close to the House on the Hill, and that will affect his independence. Uh, what do you say about that? Uh, the first part of the analysis was correct. With respect to the second one, you had a conjunctive about being close. Uh, Kenyans, I would wish to inform Kenyans and the JSC that I was appointed in 2013 to lead a team for which I'm forever grateful. 
2017, I was instructed to do the same. But despite, and this is important, despite acting for the president-elect in 2013, as soon as the brief was over, I went back to my private practice. And that relationship of me acting for the president never continued. That is why, my lord, you didn't see me in any lineup for conferment of uh, chairmanship or directorship of state corporations. The president had has at no time tried to interfere or influence me in any work that I have done. You'd remember, my lord, as a Kenyan, that not too long ago, actually last year, a cabinet secretary tried to interfere with the election or with the appointment of the vice chancellor of the University of Nairobi. I went pretty heavy on the cabinet secretary and he conceded his actions were wrongful. In other words, without saying too, uh, many, many words, no Kenyan properly informed will see me as being influenced by the president because during that period of time, I've worked for any Kenyan who has sought my services, I've worked for condemned prisoners, 5,000 of them. I'm actually maybe more popular in a few of those prisons than elsewhere. I've given them a second chance in life. Okay. I am not in any way influenced. And let's not forget this. And this is my last word. 2nd August of next year, 6 o'clock, 2nd August, no, second Tuesday of August next year, at 6.15, in Kenya, there will be a president-elect. And that president-elect would be any Kenyan other than the the president of the Republic of Kenya. Okay, sir. finally. But the issue here is perception. You, you've propounded the judicial test, but out there people don't propound the judicial test about knowing what they know. They look at you and they say, this one is like this. Allow me to... So, <laughs> let me ask my question, <laughs> Senior Council. So, having known that there is that perception out there, because it's something you have to live with, isn't it? Having known there is that perception out there, tell us, out of that situation, what do you think are the two, uh, the, 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 the two issues you consider an impediment to the independence of the judiciary arising out of that situation and how you intend to resolve them. And that will be my last question. Uh, if there is a perception, and that will be maybe subjective, because many people I interact with uh, see me as Ngatia, the lawyer, not Ngatia, the person who did the 2013-2017 petition. In between, I've acted for National Assembly. I've acted for so many other people. What I would do in the event that I'm honored and allowed to serve as the Chief Justice is to be as clear as humanly possible that in this judiciary, just like I think Chief Justice Mutunga did, the judiciary will be independent to the extent that we shall not be list, uh, being directed by anybody or authority. But we shall be independent being another arm of government. And if, for example, because of having acted for National Assembly or having acted for the President, that warmth or that relationship is to bring a speedy resolution then that will be an advantage to the, to, to the judiciary in the sense that I am, I'll be doing that which, or unlocking that which hasn't been done, particularly, say, for example, in our budget process. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you, Judge Majaja. Thank you, Senior Council. Just to follow up, uh, one thing you said, Senior Council, in your defense that... Uh, this perception may not may not be right. The perception of being close to the president as a result of uh, uh, representing him. You said that you have not been appointed as state corporation or chairmanship. So, are you telling the commission that 
those people who get appointed is because <laughs> they, they are close to the president. I thought it's because of the work they do for the public. Uh, oh, no, I think, Prof, uh, Prof <laughs> sometimes interpretations can go to any level. All I wanted to explain is this, that as soon as I finished my brief, I went back to my private practice, and that is where I came from this morning. I didn't come from any other place. All I wanted to also emphasize is as much as I'm a Kenyan, uh, please judge me on that basis. Do not discriminate me because of any client that I have acted for, because in my, the career I've had, I've acted for the high, I've acted for the poor, I've even acted for those who are on in terminal condition. Judge me a crossbow. One of the institutions I work for passionately is the hospice. In the hospice, we have terminal patients. I work for them. They are my brothers and sisters. So judge me for who I am. Do not isolate one person and discriminate me because of that. The president, like any other Kenyan, was entitled to legal representation. I'm not ashamed for acting for him. Actually, as I indicated, it was a big privilege and a mark of faith and trust that he could entrust such a massive undertaking on me. Particularly in 2013, we were navigating uncharted waters. And I did that navigation and did it successfully. Thank you, thank you, Senior Council. Um, Honorable Commissioners, you'll take a break now. Um, Zagati will take a break for 10 minutes. Uh, we'll come back at half past 11. Thank you, Prof. Thank you. This is NTV. In the past few months, we've shown up for each other. Over and over again. And as we continue to navigate COVID-19, we still need you to be there for each other. By doing one simple thing. Wear a mask. Even if you think you're low risk, a mask will help protect you and others. It's pretty simple. I wear a mask to protect my teammates, myself, and you. So wear a mask to protect yourself and others. Let's stop coronavirus together. It was founded in 2010. It is in the business of growing, collecting, and processing green leaf. We collect between 30,000 to 40,000 kilograms of green leaf per day from our 8,000 outgrowers. We were able to finance them with about 450 million to set up a tea processing factory. So I'm going to go to the college. Kipsigis Highlands Multipurpose Cooperative Society this Tuesday at 6.45 p.m. on NTV. Introducing Kwetu Mix. <laughs> 
Okay, but don't need no intro. Tangu tunge kwa mchezo si ndo heartbeat. Nairobi City tuna Iran kama athlete. Hey, if you know, you know. We have a bang. Ni wapi uliniona? Eku mix on MTV. Hapa, hapo tu. These flags are representing the people that live in Philadelphia. To make it in America, you need to be focused, steady, you need to be consistent, you need to work. My Swahili is still pretty hopeless. Uh, Jambo Buana, Missouri Sana. You can take an um, African out of Africa, but you can't take out the African in them. The experience in Kenya has been a great one, it's been positive. The, the weather is great, it's like our home city in Nigeria, which is Joss. I watch Daring Abroad. Uh -huh. Congratulations for what you do. Sisi kama Kogalo team, sahi game yetu imenda class. Tunataka players wetu wapewe koti. Yama na mna gani? Suit, suit, suit. Wapewe suiti. Daxido. Daxido. Ivo, Ivo. Goalkeeper kwanza tunataka fridge weke pale kando. Double door. Tunataka kishika ball anaenda kwa fridge anachukua. Anasema ball gani hawakujangi kufunga wanakuwa wamesinda huko goalkeeper. To get Kogalo dial star 811 star 850 hash. Skiza na nation. Fact finder from the BBC. Just how free is the media in Botswana? We tell you what we found out. Fake, fake, disgusting news. How a term popularized by Donald Trump rose to prominence during the Nigerian elections thanks to WhatsApp. We speak to one of the influential voices on Ghanaian airwaves and found out what makes her tick. And we look at how new technology transformed outside broadcasts here at the BBC back in 1948. Wow, thank you for your time. Mm. How juicy. 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 From State Farm Arena, the 2021 NBA All-Star Game. When you're able to represent your team, your family, it's not something that I take for granted at all. You know, who knows if I'm going to have a chance to get them again. So, enjoy the moment. We're going to try to get a win for sure. I just love the fact that HBCUs are being highlighted. Each quarter is like its own game, with $150,000 going to charity, and then $300,000 going to the charity of the winning team. I have been this close to this ever. Nice play. Here's Curry. Oh, beautiful pass. And the Joker with the bucket. Now we lose. With the legs moving. Two on one. LeBron with the reverse. Water?
you got rid of all the germs on Achilles' hands. The Kuza Awards are here. This year's theme is preserving our heritage through broadcasting. Vote for your favorite channel and TV for the People's Choice Award. To vote for the People's Choice Awards, SMS the word KUZA, that is K-U-Z-A, to 15601. Answer the five simple questions and press send. This text message is absolutely free. Voting ends on 23rd April 2021. Vote NTV, turning on your world for the People's Choice Awards. It's one platform where everybody has a voice. If we don't have jobs, it if we be, don't have money, it will be if, we're not, if our business... <laughs> Hosted by the King of Wit. Do you know the Bible to that much detail? It's basically everybody's show. Vitamin C ni kasava, shauri ya guvu. Vitamin D ni dania. I have decided! <laughs> the Wicked Edition with Dr. King Ori and the Guesswork CEO, Kenya Jui. The Kisumu County Assembly specializes in stimulants, to be specific, concentrated coffee. Where humor meets sense. <laughs> <laughs> the Wicked Edition, every Friday at 7.30 p.m., only on NTV. NTV, turning on your world.